We, s we start again um, with a panel uh, entitled uh, Performing Democracy. Uh, before I start, I just want to say that uh, Sana's website, The Creative Memory of the Syrian Revolution, has a newsletter that uh, uh, updates uh, often about uh, new additions to the website and the events that take place around the world uh, that deal with Syria. Uh, uh, our panel uh, uh, is, uh, we start with Zahir Omrin. Uh, Zahir is uh, the editor of this book that is being sold downstairs in uh, Tanum. Uh, he is a Syrian documentarist and uh, a researcher. He is doing his PhD now at Goldsmith University, and he works as a full-time journalist, as I understood today, as well. Um, he has been featured in the Victorian Albert exhibition, Disobedient uh, Objects, and, and in the British Council, uh, London's Third Space Exhibition. He is the co-editor of this book, and uh, he has curated several exhibitions of Syrian uprising art in Amsterdam, Copenhagen, and London. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for having me today here. Uh, as I understand, I have ten minutes to to summarize my uh, my, my my presentation today. Um, I will try to uh, it will be longer, a little bit. Uh, one of the most significant aspect of the way of the wave of of protest and uprising that began in Syria 2011 has been the use of the mobile phone camera as a tool for documentation, political activism, and creative expression. Made with limited technical means, and very often under the threat of death, these grainy, pixelated, and shaky handheld videos stand in marked contrast to the iconic images associated with the Egyptian revolution. Since the beginning of the Syrian uprising till mid of 2012, it has been estimated that more than 300,000 videos have been uploaded onto, onto YouTube and other open access sites. And this is so far the only numbers we have. During the first few months of protest, these were virtually the only images coming out of Syria. Shot from perspective of those directly involved in the uprising, these videos provided an invaluable record of society undergoing a historical moment. The unique content of those videos, however, in their closeness to death or in the urgent inclination to record those moments of historical transformation, this content provide the weaknesses of form, a legitimacy that elevates, ele elevates it to the status of cinematic model as be the phrase of French critic André Bazin. This model we will term filmer cinema. Quote, no matter how fuzzy, distorted, or disco discolored, no matter how lacking in documentary value the images may be, it proceeds by virtue of the genesis from the ontology of the model, it is the model, the end of the quote, by André Bazin. The term filmer appears so, appear used for the first time in anthropologist literature, where they use cameras filming as a research tool to understanding their field of study. Also, filma is used in the context based on John Elias' modern definition of the term. Elias uses this term to refer to non-professional filmmaker. Quote, we need a new term to describe these, th these who routinely produce such material audiovisual materials, but without the aim of being a filmmaker. Perhaps we should talk of someone as filmer. I will start with the first example, which is take place in 2011 in Aleppo.
tonight, but it's good. The most the dash went much. Then, the Syrian filmer model was inspired intellectually from the former definitions and cinematically, of course, from the Syrian revolution. It could be considers, considered as a cinematic model based on two main elements. First one, the modern technology, especially mobile phone cameras and the internet. And second one, the nature of the incidents being filmed, which is usually, in the Syrian case, a near-death experience. This cinematic model has several artistic characteristics. I'll focus on what I think is the most important characteristics. One of the, the most immediately notable characteristic of all the images generated by these devices is their low resolution. The contemporary hierarchy of images, Hito Sterlil, remind us is not only based on sharpness, but also and primarily on resolution. When we are talking about low resolution, first point we have to take into our consideration is pixelated image. The pixelated image is the key term to discover the visual, the visual aesthetics of the Syrian filmer model. Although since the evaluation of mobile cameras and the invention of the camera phone, HD and now 4K and 8K now, technology, pixelation became optional at a certain point, and it's not a continuous, a unique character characteristics to cell, phone, to, to cell phone visual aesthetics, but an elective trait in cell phone film. Here we have to consider how the YouTube resize the videos to match the guideline standard, and then it could be more a grainy image, not just pixelated image, according to the re, re according to re receded technology that applies on the videos. There is no doubt that the impact of the quality of the images turn viewer from passive receptionist into active users. Author James Ling called an unpixelated image an illusionist image, and she summarized with the view that the pixelated image is no longer something a subject simply looks at comparing it with memories of represented reality to judge, it, to judge its reality effect. Instead, these new images incite the user to receive the subject actively, zooming in or clicking, clicking on individual bars with the assumption that they contain hyperlinks. Link says, but also to go beyond the surface of the image. And this is lead us to the second example, which is I believe, maybe because I'm Hamui, the most important video in Syrian revolution. Jamaat al This video, of course, take place in, in Hamas City in 2011, showing the status of, of uh, Hafez al-Assad removed by the security forces themselves. I think because the demonstrators will, no, no, the demonstrators try to, to remove it at, uh, at that time, so they, that the security forces try to, to take it respectfully <coughs> to the security force branch before destroy, being destroyed by the uh, demonstrators. Well, the second one is ambient sound. 
Several studies suggest that the ambient sound helps the viewer to listen by their eyes. The street noise, sounds of traffic, music, voices in the background, birds singing, animals and rain could add a mood, atmosphere and humor to the film. The ambient sounds also in Syrian video context work as opposite to the voice over, over technique, which is the voice of God in Bell Nichols' world, where the natural sounds support the direct address style. The body of the filmmaker that strongly <coughs> interact with the images and with sound recording by involuntary voices that are around. And here, another example. قوات الأمن والشبيحة المتواجدة في الشارع حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل الله أكبر الله أكبر لأنه شبيحة The last characteristic of, of the Syrian filmer model is the handheld camera and body language. The moving image captured via mobile phone creates the impression for the viewer in two dimensions. The first one is similar to the impression transmitted by the movement shot in the traditional cinema, which is generally attracts the viewer eye more to the focus of the shot through the high dependency between the distribution of the sample points and the direction of the camera motion. The second impression assumes that the director is closer to his subjects than his counterpart in classical cinema. In other words, the conditions of the traditional film industry creates a distance varying between the director and his film, and thus between the film and the receiver. It is therefore about personal image and predilection for close-up shots and the movement of the camera which is create adjusters and blurring effects. In addition to the most important point here, I mean the interactivity between the camera or the body of the filmmaker and the event, which is in Syrian case, death or its parallels. This is one of the earliest videos that came from Syria. The last bit of this paper's question of quality. As the artist Thomas Herson points out, the unverifiability 
of the mobile phone images reflects today unclearness. For obvious reason, most of the videos circulated online remain anonymous. Rabi Amrou's The Pixelated Revolution is the multimedia art performance that also doubles as an unacademic lecture and invite, invites us to see the low resolution video, videos uploaded by Syrian protester not as technically flawed or artistically deficient images but also but as bolivalent representations that are a product of the extra, extraordinary conditions under which they were made. Here, the, vo the focus became those astonishing videos, which, uh, which, in, which the person operating the camera accidentally films his own shooting, while the video outlives the event. We cannot be sure if the person recording it is alive or dead. I would like to see these as a kind of degree zero of documentary filmmaking which is the main characteristics of the filmer cinema or Syrian filmer cinema. I will end up this with the last example as well. The last video was part of the uh, audiovisual installation called X-Ray Syria, showed in the Third Space exhibition in British Council, London. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zahir. Uh, we'll move on directly to Mohammed uh, Al Attar, uh, who will uh, now talk about theatre. Uh, Mohammed is a Syrian playwright and uh, dramaturg. His theatrical works, Withdrawal, Samah, Online, Could You Please Look Into the Camera, A, Ch uh, a Chance Encounter, Antigone of Syria, and others, have been performed uh, in Damascus, London, New York, Seoul, Berlin, Brussels. He's been traveling a lot. Uh, or at least his work has been traveling a lot. <laughs> um, he has written for numerous magazines and newspapers, and he reported at the beginning of the revolution from inside Syria. He used to go inside Syria, uh, especially at the northern border. Those who have followed the revolution a lot know especially his work on Raqqa, uh, where he documented the, the, the beginning of uh, the Islamization of, uh, and the militarization of the Syrian revolution. Tfadal uh, Mohammed. Thank you, Rana, and thank you, everybody who are here. It's a lovely uh, Saturday afternoon, so I appreciate you. I want to be out myself, so thank you very much. I'll try to be as short as I can. Actually, I uh, yeah, I deleted most of what I wanted to say because I thought it's uh, it's maybe better to open more room for uh, questions if there are any questions, and uh, try just to. And after also the brilliant presentation. Maybe it's good to shift more towards, uh, I mean, I'm not saying it was a pessimistic one, but it's uh, special for me uh, to re recall all these memories. Actually, they are there. It's not, they are not far away, but just to bring them back more freshly, I think I'll try now to, to try to focus on some uh, promising signs of, uh, yeah, from this uh, ongoing tragedy. Uh, um, I would say that, uh, before, even before the revolution yesterday, some of you were here yesterday because uh, our colleague Yasin Hassaleh, unfortunately, he's not with us today. He 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 said a few times during his interventions in this uh, uh, panel or in this gathering that uh, people tend not just to forget that the Syrian tragedy or the Syrian uh, resistance against uh, uh, authoritarian regime 
has been going for at least four and a half years now, the revolution, but in reality, it has been going for like 40 or 45 years because uh, this regime has been in power for half a century almost now. And uh, the resistance never stopped. Maybe it was not so obvious like in uh, during the time of the revolution, after the so-called Arab Spring happened in region, Tunisia, Egypt, Yemen, Libya, and then Syria, and, and hopefully uh, Lebanon on the list, Iraq now, the rest to come. Uh, um, but it's, the, 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 uh, I think there was never uh, the resistance showed by people uh, uh, was, was not there. But it, it, it depends on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the time, on how uh, we can exp uh, expand this. Uh, from here, I will go to culture. I think cultural practices in Syria, uh, for me, they always stand as a form of resistance. Uh, maybe not in a uh, in a form which took uh, out, uh, a direct clash with the authorities because that was, uh, to be honest, uh, absurd or uh, kind of committing suicide just to, for example, to make a piece of art regardless what the form is or the medium, theater, cinema, uh, to criticize the authority that wouldn't, would, uh, wouldn't be wise, to be honest, even and would not lead to anywhere. But I think insisting on making culture, insisting on trying to defy uh, this uh, manipulation and this uh, uh, severe control by the regime uh, on every aspect of life in Syria. The regime that uh, destroyed political life in Syria and more importantly uh, destroyed uh, civil society and civil practices in Syria. And, for, uh, and also uh, uh, I think uh, destroyed a promising signs of uh, of a culture raised in Syria, uh, for example, in a city of uh, more than uh, uh, four and a half million, which is Damascus, the capital, we had uh, uh, at least I, uh, from, I would say from late 80s till, till before the revolution, we had four or five cinema houses in the whole for four and a half million. And one of these five cinema houses were, were, were screening uh, new movies and these new movies are all Hollywood blockbusters and we had three theaters three stages all controlled by the uh, the National Theater Organization which general organization is uh, very very close to, not close it's part of the Ministry of Culture which is of course part of the uh, regime propaganda machine uh, so just just to give you such figures about while for example in 50s and 60s uh, uh, we know from our uh, parents and our grandparents that they, uh, they, you, they that was a kind of uh, a weekly thing to go to the cinema, regardless of, by the way, uh, how socially you are conservative or less conservative, you are middle class or maybe lower class. Cinemas were more uh, spread all over the city. Speaking about Damascus, at least because I'm poor and raised in Damascus, uh, going to theater was more common. Uh, Etc. So just just to give you the uh, and 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 more importantly, I think uh, when we speak about uh, 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 the, the uh, practicing culture or art as as a form of resistance is is also how to defy the censorship. And I think that was that was key thing actually uh, for me to consider that uh, culture is it, it is uh, uh, in reality practically in Syria before the revolution and after it later. It was a tool of protest, a tool to say that we won't uh, surrender completely uh, to the uh, authoritarian or totalitarian uh, practices and, and we want to prove that we can create our margins, how, uh, uh, no matter how they are narrow, but uh, to, to try to, uh, to keep uh, awareness uh, in the community, try to provoke people to ask some questions or to think about questions and uh, or to try to investigate some of the taboos and there were many taboos in Syria. Uh, it, is, uh, it is well known to be the nickname of the country is the kingdom of fear, uh, of course. Uh, uh, I'll try to give a few examples from, from my practice and, and my, of course I'm not working alone. Uh, uh, I joined the Higher Institute of Dramatic Arts in Damascus, which is the only theater institute. And uh, Zahir also is a graduate from this institute, so we have bright people who graduated from the institute. Um, 
which is the only theater institute in in, in Syria, of course. Uh, uh, and at uh, and I joined the institute after, of course, graduating from the Faculty of English Literature in Damascus University, where I discovered that uh, education and higher education in Syria is also very corrupted and very, very bad. I would say. Um, so you cannot count on this. So the institute was kind of uh, a place which, uh, to, to an extent, was still standing relatively against this uh, uh, bad curriculums, against this uh, total control by the authorities on every corner or aspect of, of life, including education. Because, of course, universities, as you know, played and play always a major role in any uh, social and political changes. And they played that role in Syria uh, in 50s and 60s, by the way. They were a hub for uh, movements, of youth movements, of even political parties and stuff like this. So one of the, uh, of course, uh, first targets by the Syrian regime, Ba'ath uh, Party, uh, is to, was to crush any political uh, life in universities. Uh, and this is an, a long story. So uh, the institute was, to an extent, because it was a very small, uh, not very, de not very desired by many to join. Because you will be an artist. I mean, you you barely can earn a living, and you are not so respected in the society to, to an extent. And also because there were some of the teachers who were, thanks for them. We we just give them the credits. Were from the old school, studied in Russia and France. And uh, so they managed to sustain a kind of good quality of teaching, though it was a, a bit harsh and uh, with a hierarchy, uh, with strong hierarchy. But that's, I think, in art schools in general, the teacher is more like a master and a god or something. Like that. Mm -hmm. But this is not our topic today. Uh, so. Uh, so thanks for them, uh, we, they managed to sustain kind of good quality of teaching. But So in the institute, I think, and maybe Zahar agrees, we had this uh, slightly wilder margins to think and try to reflect and to think about how cultural practices could, could play uh, a role in trying to defy this, uh, 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 I mean, uh, absolute control by the authorities. Uh, it was in 2004. When we started, I was still student. Uh, started uh, doing uh, starting an initiative, which was the first in Syria, to move with theater to outside uh, outside boxes or stages, to go to countryside, to very remote and poor and uh, unprivileged uh, uh, rural areas around the country. Uh, to do that, we used uh, the theory and the practices of uh, a Brazilian theorist and uh, theater maker called Augusto Poal. Uh, he invented, uh, or he, uh, he created the theory of uh, theater of the oppressed, which is kind of umbrella of exercises mm -hmm. and forms uh, mainly helped uh, practitioners to work with uh, oppressed and marginalized groups. So that was the first initiative we did. We went to uh, to very poor and marginalized uh, 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 villages and uh, applied what we call a forum theater, which is a very simple technique. It's actually very sophisticated, but it, in terms of if the form is simple. You just uh, you study where you are going to, so you know where uh, the context you are working in. I don't know if this is the case in Norway. There is a square in the middle of the village, kind of a, a gathering point you join, either a square or something like an open space. And you, you call for people to come, and they come, and you just uh, present the scene with the professional actors, of course, and they should be very good actors, to be honest. Uh, I'm not an actor myself. I just write the scenes, so it's the easiest part. And, uh, and uh, the scene actually goes on till it reaches a climax, and then the Joker, which is the main player, he, his nickname is Joker, frees the scene with the actors like freezing uh, at the moment. And then he asks the uh, audience to step in the scene, voluntarily of course, and try to solve the solution because it's stuck at one point. And, and we need somebody to, to, to get it out of this uh, dilemma. And then the, here the interaction slowly uh, uh, began. And first, they, it, uh, the, uh, it began in forms of suggestions by, by audience member. 
And then we, the Joker insisting on, no, it's, talking is not enough. You should come in and replace one of the characters. You choose one character and sh so, uh, show us how you or, uh, can uh, act in his or her shoes. And then uh, things will evolve from here till we, we together find a solution symbolically to this. Actually, uh, um, the result of this, uh, it's very effective, though it's simple. It's the only way, because between this, there are uh, actually very thick border between the audience uh, space and this playground, though it's not, there is no border in reality. But people, when they are come into the playground or the play space, uh, because they are playing, because they are acting, they can speak things that they cannot speak when they are stepping outside. Uh, but, sen but then when they speak, uh, they speak. For us, this is the most important. So we, we provoke this debate. We actually uh, can in the playground because we're asking them to come and play. So we are not doing real life here. Uh, we are not asking you to do anything uh, you don't want to do in real life. Come and just play and show us how we can do this in, in this. This is uh, uh, photos from, these are the actors. It's uh, in April 2005. This is a, a, a village in rural Homs in middle of Syria. It's more uh, no, near the border of North Lebanon. Thank you, Zahir, for your precious help. These are the audience member. They are watching the, the forum scene. And these are the actors, Gavin and Aham. And these are the actors, of course. And here, for example, this is one when, when uh, Kamil is the actor, and this is the guy who replaced one of the actors, I am, and he's now continuing the scene. It's very old photo, by the way. The kids, the women, and this is I am. Can, uh, yeah, this is this. Yeah. So they just gather and look at the scene. They try, you know, and this is very simple illustration. These are actors. Okay. That's it. Just, uh, yeah. <coughs> so for us, well, that's the first experience, actually, to, to try to, uh, and that, by the way, just to say that this project was stopped because of censorship, uh, naturally. And actually, I was astonished how we managed to last for almost two years. Not, not on a regular basis, but over two years, we managed to visit many villages. And uh, just to give you some examples, in each village, we most probably knew the informer for the regime because they sometimes present themselves because they are either the, the, uh, the headmaster in the school or the path party representative in this, I mean, I don't know how to say it. Uh, the responsible of the, of the ruling party in the village. So he came and shake, and he usually sit in the front row and people respect him. So we know he's, he's writing the, the report <laughs> later, so telling the authority what we were playing. And so, and, uh, so, and so it was stopped later. It, we were asked to stop, uh, and the, the fund was cut. Actually, the pressure was on the funding uh, party, not on us, which was UNDP. The, it's a UN organization. It's, uh, anyway, it's not a local fund. Uh, okay, from, I think from, from there, uh, it was for us a brilliant examination of the effectiveness of, of theater, because this is my tool or my practice, uh, on engaging more directly uh, with issues related to social, economical, political change. Uh, I will jump very quickly because it's, it's, a, it's a long journey, actually. Uh, of we, we did many things, including uh, a one and only uh, play that been done in Syria inside the prisons establishment inside actually in Ju juvenile institute in 2008. Also, I did, till today I don't know how they allowed us to work, but we were lucky. We were there for three months. We worked with the prisoners, with juvenile actually. It's like prisoners from 16 to 18 or 15 to 18, uh, and that was brilliant also experience. Actually, in, in the revolution after the revolution started. Uh, Many things changed, and I have to say that at the beginning, even we were hesitant. Uh, we had this question of what shall we do, and uh, and what what is really the value of our work, and how will uh, whether at all it's valuable or not anymore. 
because at the beginning, like uh, most of Syrians, we were overwhelmed by the movement, uh, and we wanted just to be in it. Uh, and being in it means being in the street, uh, like demonstrating, taking part, debating, maybe uh, provoking others to demonstrate and to uh, take over public spaces whenever we could, of course. Uh, and uh, it took us some time, I would say, uh, to realize that, uh, but also we can use our tools. We can go back to theater and, and ask some questions about our practices and see how also uh, our uh, tools could be uh, used in this. And, uh, and that was a very important thing because I think it's also for the art maker, uh, it is a, 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 a serious examination for the practices. It's a combination of ethical and technical questions about your practice too. And uh, what, what should change in your practice? What is the meaning of your practice today? Uh, what is the goals and uh, what are uh, the, the borderlines between art and uh, uh, say resistance or political action. Uh, um, uh, and, and yes, we started actually to make apparently two types of work, I would say, Com more conventional theater, which is trying to reflect on the situation in, in Syria, working with uh, w uh, as a, as an ensemble of professionals like uh, me, a professional director, and professional actors. Uh, so we, we delivered a few uh, productions, trying to reflect on the social political situation in Syria. Beside that, actually, we also tried to open up uh, and work with with uh, with with people. Uh, to try to address the question of representation, because it is also a very complicated uh, uh, question, ethically also and technically, because as, as we saw uh, with Sana, as we, uh, and maybe Zahir uh, also uh, showed us a lot of amateur workers or unknown artists, uh, but artists in general tend to, whether they, they wanted or not, to represent others, you know, especially if they are coming from uh, a crisis or, or uh, a context like Syria. When you have uh, uh, conflicting news, when uh, audiences are, are around the globe, they are seeking to know more about Syria. And in the case of a regime like the one in Syria, uh, they applied uh, an effective kind of media blockade, especially at the uh, beginning of the revolution, where no correspondence, no foreign media can enter or, or work actively from inside. So artists, whether they like it or not, whether they want it or not, uh, they, they claim representation that sometimes ethically it's dangerous. So by, by trying to work with the people, in, in, in whether they are refugees uh, or internal displaced people who are like refugees but inside the, the, the country moving from, or people uh, are, are in, a, in a very uh, tough situations, it's more also to try to collaborate with them, to give them the platform uh, and to try to hear directly from them and try to hear their own reflections on the ongoing situation because they have uh, every, every, I think one of the beauty of this revolution that it liberated our voices as Syrian, and it proved to us first and to the other that uh, each voice is important, each voice is, uh, should be counted, each voice is valu valuable and deserves to be heard. Uh, so we, we, we started to work inside and outside Syria as much as we could. I will just give an example because it has, I think, a meaning and because also Rana mentioned briefly, in a workshop I did in Raqqa, in northeast Syria, which now is the capital of IS, unfortunately. Uh, um, this workshop uh, took place in August 2013, almost two years from now. During that time, uh, the city was uh, liberated from regime forces. Back mm -hmm. and uh, during that time, um, it was under the uh, control of, of uh, different military uh, groups. One of them was IS, so IS was present back then and we were seeing their checkpoints and they were there, but they were not dominant. Later they became, they uh, took over uh, control. Ahrar al-Sham, which is another Salafi jihadi group, and a Free Syrian Army. So the three uh, groups were there and they were divided, sharing the control of the city. Uh, uh, it was part of a, a, a series of workshops I did in North, Northeast Syria. And uh, it was very clear objective for me. I trained 
uh, it's like GOT thing, like you train trainers or you train potential trainers, those who are willing to convey this uh, training to others. And the objective was to how to work with traumatized adolescents. This is, was the objective of the, of the workshop. So uh, in each city, I stayed over a week. Oh, or sorry, the workshop was over a week because I stayed longer in Raqqa. So, uh, and I worked with uh, people who, who were willing to participate. So they came from different, uh, uh, most of them were university students. Some of them were, uh, in this workshop, were lawyers, young lawyers, citizen reporters, uh, or journalists. Uh, some were working with the Red Crescent. We have the Red Crescent, which is parallel to the Red, Red Cross. So they came, uh, some were teachers. Uh, but all of them were engaged in, in a different context uh, with working with adolescents. And the workshop, again, was how to use theatrical pra some theatrical practice, how to try to uh, work with traumatized adolescents by uh, using storytelling techniques and some games, trying just to, uh, to achieve some kind of relief and some kind of sharing painful stories uh, among the group. Uh, so these are, yes, the photo. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean there are, but I just, what is striking in the photo is that this, I will show you, can you go on? Uh, yeah, please. Can you stop it? For example, the guys here, uh, no, the photo after, maybe. No, anyway, <laughs> just go ahead. Before, before. Okay. Here, here, can you stop here? Okay. So in this photo, <coughs> it's not clear, but we'll say, the guy, he's standing in the middle, with this, uh, not, yeah, the two actually. I will come to them. Okay. Uh, <coughs> they were after the workshop. Uh, they were kidnapped by Daesh. He was released, and, uh, and he still disappeared. Most probably he's killed, unfortunately. And uh, can we go? Uh, just uh, uh, next one. Next one. Okay, uh, maybe, yeah, the guy also was, uh, he was, uh, when we worked, he was recently released by the regime. Uh, he was detained at the regime, by the regime forces. And after the workshop, uh, in one month, he was kidnapped by IS, and we don't know where he is now. Um, and there's another guy who also, his, uh, maybe it was in the first, anyway, this guy with the glasses, the young guy, he also was kidnapped by IS, and we don't know anything. Uh, shortly, uh, not because of the workshop, just to be very precise. No, no, not because of the workshop. But it's just, uh, uh, for me, why this is for me always uh, important to remember that uh, the city was really, I mean, when I arrived to Raqqa, I remember there was, uh, I think, 24 uh, uh, initiatives by young people. It's like, I, I hate the word NGOs, but they are kind of, they are not enjoyed, but initiatives. This was Raqqa in, 2000, uh, in August 2013, uh, after uh, being liberated by regime forces. People were willing, and you say it's a mixed group. You had girls in the group. And just to tell you more, th with this hall, it's uh, the lawyer union hall, OK? You see the, and uh, the guy who was in charge of it, they told, I, I wanted a space, and the Raqqa is, is already a very poor city. There is no uh, good space. Uh, I want just simple space with no chairs. And just, uh, just technically, it will help me. And they told me there is one space. It's uh, ideal. And I went to see it. It was empty. I told them, who, who shall I speak to? Because I need this space. They said, but we don't advise you because the guy, he's from Ahrar al-Sham, which is a uh, Salafi jihadi troop in, in, uh, in Syria. Um, but I said, I will try. I mean, he's local. He's from Raqqa. So I went, and he was like with the beard, with the shaved mustache. Uh, and I just told him I want to do a workshop. And he asked about what? I told him theater. And <laughs> he, was, he was amazed a bit. But then I just explained to him what I want to do. And I told him to come and, and to watch. Uh, no, to participate, because he cannot come and watch. This is one of the rules. You cannot just come and watch told him, you can't come and participate. And of course, he refused. But he actually, uh, he, he, gave, he gave us the permission to work. And each day, like each two days, he was checking on us if you want anything. 
And I think I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I have a lot of problems with the ideologies of Ahrar al-Sham. But I think just, uh, the, the, uh, for me, the example, I use it not to praise the movement or the, the Salafi Jihadi uh, group. It's just to say that there were rooms of negotiation between people if they have the time and luxury to do so. Uh, because, uh, again, Raqqa at that time was kind of an okay relative situation, uh, uh, recently re re liberated from the regime forces. People, ha uh, they have the momentum, you know, and they have the feeling that they achieved something. Uh, and I think that was one of the moments when you feel, even if you are speaking with somebody who we don't agree, uh, and we don't share the same principles regarding the next Syria. Because, he, I mean, I, I spoke with the guy later, uh, Asyad, his name, uh, uh, and, uh, and he said clearly he wants an Islamic Syria, not a Khilafah, but a Syria that is uh, uh, like where, where Islam, Islam uh, is, is a main uh, source of constitution. So anyway, this was just an example to see. I'm already done. Okay, kind of. Okay, and we, uh, yeah, I mean, it was hard to go back to Syria, and uh, uh, yeah, the guys now, uh, uh, all of them, unfortunately, left Syria, so they couldn't continue the brilliant work they do. Uh, those who survived from the regime couldn't survive from IS, and this tells a lot about the tragedy in Syria. Uh, okay. uh, uh, you want me to speak about no, this? No, Okay, so I'll stop here because I want, uh, you want me to speak, but we can speak about Antigone later. Yes, sure. we can speak about Antigone later. So that's it, I, sorry, I'm, uh, I wanted to be shorter even. Yeah. This was uh, great, Mohammed. I didn't stop you because it was fascinating, I forgot the time. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you. <laughs>